talking to a great extent this semester about your own educational journeys. Um, you know Dr. Holloman so far as the president of the college. Uh, but he has a history too. Before he was a president, he was a provost. And before provost, he was a classroom teacher. Before that, he went to graduate school. And way back then, he went to um, University of North Carolina as, as an undergraduate. So his life, like all of our lives, is a journey as well. And we've invited him back this morning uh, to talk more about his journey and yours. Please welcome Dr. Christopher Holloman. Thanks, Dr. Shelburne. Uh, yeah, it's a real pleasure uh, to, to be with you. And, and uh, as, as uh, Steve said, and we'll talk about it in a little bit more, um, you know, I love to teach. It's uh, why I got into this business. It's why I moved from a big research university to a, a small liberal arts college. I stumbled into administration, which means I don't get to teach very often, and so I really uh, love having these kinds of opportunities. And so today is really a kind of continuation of some of the things we talked about uh, at freshman convocation, which I know most of you probably don't remember anymore, but that's okay. Uh, so we began to talk about journeying. Um, and. I want to emphasize that you know at Centenary, it's not it's not my responsibility. It predates me, and 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 the current uh, folks associated with Trek have really picked up the ball, especially uh, Professor Hamming. The the Trek metaphor is not accidental, and it's not just sort of some rando, you know, let's call it something cool. We really take seriously this notion that well, a that we're all on a journey together, but you in particular. Are in a unique time. And so trying to, again, as I did on that convocation, push the metaphor of journey a little bit, continue to talk about it. When we go on a journey, we need a map. And I used to teach uh, world history and geography. And one of, my, was, uh, one of my favorite lectures is early in the semester about maps. And some of us, I know, will be second nature to many of you. There's actually a, a little episode of uh, one part of an episode of the West Wing about it. If you go Google West Wing map, you can watch it. I didn't want to show it because it would steal all my thunder. So, uh, so we're not showing it today. But the important thing to remember is that all maps are, to a greater or lesser extent, lies. Because you can't convert the three-dimensional globe round shape of the Earth onto a flat two-dimensional space without introducing some distortion. Again, I know that this is familiar to many of you. So this is a classroom map, very familiar. Uh, it is in the, old, the oldest uh, map projection still in routine use called Mercator or Mercator projection. It's horrible. It's only really good for one thing. It's only really good if uh, you were sailing and navigating over a relatively small period uh, portion of space. It's fairly good at, at direction, but it's terrible in terms of a number of other things, most notoriously uh, shape and size. As you get closer to the poles, size is distorted. So we're all used to thinking that Greenland is about the same size as Africa, when it's really only about 1 16th the size. We think of Alaska as this huge blob of land over there compared to Mexico, Alaska and Mexico are almost exactly the same size. Mexico is actually a little bit larger. So there are other ways of, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you all hear me if I'm not speaking at the podium? <laughs> there, we won't have that problem. Um, so there are lots of other ways of projecting the globe onto the map. So you've got the Mercator here in its worst form. Look how big, big Greenland is there. Uh, mole wide, it's fairly, uh, fairly standard. Uh, there's actually a really cool tool. I'm actually going to back out of uh, uh, PowerPoint for just a second. And, uh, here. This is actually a really interesting tool that I, I found where you can compare uh, map projections. You know, I know you can't read it, but so the first column is name. You don't need to pay attention to that. Accuracy, scale, uh, size, or, or land mass, and, and shape. So here, see the Mercator projection of Mercator is good on scale and not too bad on, uh, on shape. 
but it's terrible on size and so forth. And you can you can actually manipulate this and look at all the different projections, and that's kind of fun. Um, uh, and again, all of them, each of them had their advantages and disadvantages, but they're all misrepresentations. And I wanted to, uh, and, and just to play play that a little bit farther. So this is a fairly uh, standard, fairly decent projection. It compromises on all of those things, so it's it's not fully accurate on any of those measures. <coughs> what, what strikes you about this this projection? What, what, when when you look at this map, what do you note? The U.S. is in the center. The, right, exactly. The United States is in the center. Is there any particular reason that should be the case? We're the best. Okay, thank you. Um, of course, the most populous parts of the world, India and China, are are divided up. So, you know, there's there's nothing. But we're so used to thinking this way. When you begin to look at it differently and look at different projections or or different, you you realize that the way you think about your life, your map, you need to think about where have you introduced misperceptions or, or so we'll talk more about that in a minute. And of course, one that used to blow people's minds a lot is if you look at it this way. There is no up or down on Earth. You know, I, people cannot, I, I've had students fight me on this. Well, if you go out and look in space, the Northern Hemisphere is up. Well, no, only because that's the way we're always shown it. The Southern Hemisphere is just as equally up but, but we never think about that. So how you think about maps are important. And just finally, this is a, a one that a lot of people advocate for because it's very good on uh, relative size. And so it really brings home the point that Africa is gigantic. Um, and, but it's not in wide use. Can anybody guess why? People don't like it because it's ugly. They don't, they, they think the shapes are, you know, they're, they're not used to seeing the shapes that way. Somebody said it looks like a bunch of laundry hung out to dry on a line, uh, you know. But uh, one last uh, map tool that uh, I want to show you, and you should play, you, you really should go uh, and play with this called, how big is it, I think? Um, so uh, the true size of. So with this tool, you can put in any country and then, uh, or even region, and get the true size of, of it. So um, if we put in uh, Alaska, and then you can drag it around, and you find out that, well, you know, Alaska really isn't quite as big as we think because it's so misrepresented by the size of, you know, by the distortion of the pole of the Mercator map. And check this out. It, I, I'm not trying to hammer on how big Africa is, but we just don't recognize it. Look, you can fit all of China, all of the continental United States, and India into Africa. India, if we've messed around with this, I don't want to take the time, but try, try overlapping India with Europe. We're thinking, we think of India as this, you know, kind of small country. It looks that way because it's close to the equator. And we think of, of Europe, wow, it's big up there, but India is, bigger than all of Europe, uh, obviously some overlay parts. So, so uh, yeah, the true size.com. go there and, and poke around that, I think it's pretty fun. Uh, so anyway, um, if we move to the, to the next <coughs> sort of iteration of this, we get to a topic that is sometimes called mental mapping, uh, but uh, is more accurately called uh, cognitive mapping. And that's sort of the way we think about things, how we think about areas around us. There's a very famous finding, it's been replicated many times, that there's significant gender differences between our cognitive maps. If you add, on average, I mean everything's, you know, if you ask females how to get from one place to another, they will tell you how to get there by landmarks. You know, you go to the mobile station, you go to, you know, whatever. Uh, males tend to tell by paths or cardinal directions go three miles and turn north. There's no right or wrong, it's just gender differences. This is an example, it's a little bit old, this is an example of the world according to the United States of America. Um, so, um, you know, uh, 
Mexico with tequila. Um, south, south is uh, Australia's kangaroos. Uh, famous uh, journalist uh, in the early part of the 20th century, Ambrose Bierce, said that uh, war is uh, God's way of teaching Americans geography. Uh, so, uh, we're notoriously bad at geography. Um, but the point is that, uh, to, to sort of begin to segue, the point is that as we interact with the world around us, as you are on this journey, you will begin to develop your own cognitive maps, not just of the world around you, but of your life and how it's playing out. <coughs> Humans are relentless meaning makers. We bring in information and we sort it and we turn it into meaning even when there's no objective reason that this means that. And I've got one little movie clip that'll be familiar to some of you. Uh, I'm distressed to know that it counts as an old movie now, uh, but I know many of you have seen it from uh, A Beautiful Mind, the story of the great mathematician John Nash. Uh, goes to say something that I used to know how to calculate a Nash equilibrium, but I don't anymore. But uh, so he's uh, courting his to be wife. I once tried to count them all. <coughs> I actually made it to 4,348. You are exceptionally lovely. I bet you're very popular with the girls. out of the light. He, he, he finds an umbrella in the bright stars. In the same way that humans from time immemorial have drawn their own patterns in, in the uh, uh, Duty Camp. What do you call that? The, uh, Duty Camp. Right. Yeah. What do you call the uh, uh, Constellations. Uh, yeah, so. Um, so, again, that's what we do as humans. And I want to take us to the next level then and talk not about these, um, uh, not about these, these uh, mental maps of uh, regions <coughs> or even the way we ascribe meaning to the stars, but the way we think about making meaning in our lives and the way and how that translates to maps. So I know you can't read this, and again, I'll direct you to the website if you're interested, uh, www.getclarity.com. Uh, and this is this firm, they're, they're a firm, I think they're selling life coaching, uh, life coaching experience or, or whatever. But no, but so they, they, they've created this metaphorical journey map of your life. And if you could read it, you would see things, you know, set your course and recognizing that you're gonna hit <coughs> eddies where you could actually get stuck you know and then you'll go on and and uh have have these other experiences you'll learn and grow and then eventually you'll end up at some sort of peak experience uh, oops, sorry sherry i knocked off my uh, microphone um here's a little less touchy-feely version of this i want to spend a little bit of time on this and then you'll hear about my story So I can do it without the slide. So a different, uh, a different way of thinking about this is a four-stage process. For the first stage is discover. Sociologists tell us that 90% of, of uh, a 90% predictor of success in whatever is that you're passionate about it. That for, for whatever reason, you want to be doing it.
So th this is a, a kind of cool, cool graphic. Discover, discover where your passion is. And then move on, plan. And this is, you're kind of beginning, you're in both of these stages, I think. Based on your, on your passion, begin to think about how is that gonna translate in your life. Create some sort of life plan or at least begin to think about it. What are your goals? What are your talents? What? Is there a question? Here? Oh, yes, please. What if you like a lot of different things, though? Well, I think that's a good question. What if you like a lot of different things? I'll be frank. You need to begin thinking about, you know, uh, which of them will pay the bills. Uh, you know, um, what, what, can be your, what can be your vocation and what can be your avocation? Um, and we all have different things. And understand, especially for your generation, I hate to sound like an old fart, but uh, you're going to have the opportunity to change, you know, and so I'm going to pursue this passion for a while. So I know, I've got a good friend who said, I really want to do serious, uh, not competitive, but sort of world-class hiking, mountain climbing. I'm not going to be able to do that when I'm 45. I need to do that when I'm 25. Uh, and, and so he did recognizing that at some point he was <coughs> going to have to, to retool and, or, or make some other uh, adjustment. Implement your plan. Do the right things. Do things that reflect what you've done before, your goals and your core values. And then finally, our faculty members will recognize this seems a lot like an assessment uh, cycle. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, monitor. How are you doing? Are you enjoying it? Is this in fact where your passion lies? Has your passion changed? Are you passionate about it, but frankly you're just not very good at it? I mean, I would love to be an artist. Actually, I wouldn't, but, um, but let's say I did. I'm terrible at drawing. I, 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 can't, I can't make a good circle. Um, so, so I, again, this is just a way of thinking about I want to challenge you. And so now, as, as previewed, um, I'll, let me tell you a little bit about my journey, including heretofore unseen photos of me uh, uh, from other times. So I was born. I started out as a baby. We're not going to look at that very long. Then I was a teenager. Uh, check out the lapels on that jacket, um, you know, awkward family photos. Um, there, there, actually, there was a time in between those two pictures to talk about just a little bit. When I was in uh, elementary school or maybe junior high, I read a book called, uh, there was a series for young adults at that time called We Were There. And it put two little kids, two adolescents, in historical settings. You know, we were there at the signing of the Declaration of Independence or whatever. And for some reason, the one I had picked up was we were there at the first nuclear chain reaction. And it talked about Enrico Fermi, and he created this first graphite pile uh, in the squash court underneath the football stadium at the University of Chicago. Completely missing. <coughs> That's where I ended up doing my graduate work. University of Chicago, not the squash court. Um, uh, it was gone by then. It's actually gone, and they had put the library in there, and the rumor was that if you took, uh, what do you call it, a Geiger counter uh, down to the bottom, to the B level of Regenstein Library, it would still go off from the background radiation. Unfortunately, in high school, I discovered that, so I wanted to be a nuclear physicist from reading this book. I told everybody, I'm going to be a nuclear physicist. Unfortunately, I realized I'm not that good at lab science. So that went out the window. I began to think about what I want to do. I really wanted to be, and I decided I love international relations. Wouldn't it be really cool to be a diplomat, to work in the State Department? And so that was my major at Chapel Hill. I, I finished with both concentrations in political science and economics. I was ready. I took the foreign service exam. It's sort of like the GRE, the written. Only about 10% of the people pass it. I took it as a junior and I passed it. And that means you have to go to Washington and take an oral exam. And I crashed and burned. It was horrific. I, it was just mortifying. <laughs> OK, so back to my senior year. Get better. Took the foreign service officer exam, FSOE it's called foreign service officer exam. Took it again, passed it again, went back to Washington for my orals, <laughs> crashed and burned. It was terrible. I, I remember distinctly 
be sitting across from this foreign service officer who's examining me, and he asked me a question about the World Bank. I was clueless. Now I do know about the World Bank. I uh, lectured to Dr. Christian in his class about it. But looking back on it, it's embarrassing for me to know how much I didn't know. That career path was shrinking, perhaps even closing. Went back home. Uh, I went to work for my father. My father and his uncles, or his, his brothers, my uncles, owned a department store in Raleigh, North Carolina. The big, what had been the big fancy downtown department store, they had moved out in the, in the uh, mid-50s, actually one of the first department stores to move to a shopping center. I went to work for him, I was pretty good at it. I was a buyer, I, bought, uh, I, I was a buyer for home furnishings and sheets and towels and rugs and stuff like that. I learned the business pretty quickly, I, I was good at it. But then, I, I don't know if I would have stayed in that business forever or not. But for a variety of family reasons, my father and his brothers had to sell the department store. Um, they were ready to get out of the business. There was nobody except me and the family that was working. I couldn't afford to buy the store. They needed the money. They, they actually didn't, but the widows of two of my uncles did. They sold it to a man who had been in the pennies organization his whole career. Uh, a, he wasn't very good at it, not being in that corporate structure. And he was, I think, understandably uncomfortable having the, the son of the former owner uh, working for him. I didn't like him very much either, so the feeling was mutual. Um, I remember distinctly, I was driving, my wife, uh, we lived in Chapel Hill, I was working in Raleigh. We were driving over one Saturday morning, my wife was with me, I was talking about how unhappy I was. I ended up being unhappy in this job, and she said, well, what do you want to be? I said, well, I guess I want to be a college professor. And she said, well, you'll have to go back to graduate school then, won't you? So I went to graduate school, very you know, good, fun time, Chicago's great, University of Chicago's great. Got my first job at, at SUNY Buffalo, was doing okay, but not, I wasn't succeeding wildly because, as I already indicated, I love to teach. And teaching is not valued, it's not rewarded at big research one universities. I had a very clear mental image of what I wanted to be. So I moved to a liberal arts college, and I became what I wanted to be, the cool college professor, right? <laughs> Posing in front of the map. I was on TV as an international relations expert from time to time. I still have that jacket, but it's too heavy. It never gets cold enough in Shreveport to wear it. Um, that was my mental image. And then, somehow or other, we ended up here. I was, I was asked to step in as the provost for this college for six months. Six months became 10 years. In the midst of that time, my wife and I went through a program called uh, Mission and Vocation, sponsored by the Umbrella Organization for Colleges and in, in small, small and medium-sized private colleges. And we spent a year with some guidance and mentors thinking about what is it that you want to do? What is your calling? What is your vocation? So you've got that, think about a Venn diagram. You've got that circle of, of your vocation. How do you figure out what the mission of a college you might want to be a president at? Do you want to be a president? And a number of the people in the program went through this year and they realized, I don't want to be a president. I realized that I might like to be a president, but not just any president. I have a very clear vision of what the mission of a college that I would like to lead is. Two years ago, spring of 16, winter of 16, the announcement of the vacant of the position at Centenary came open. I was actually not applying for jobs. I wasn't on the job market. Uh, uh, we were, I was leading a major, our 10-year reaccreditation process at, at this institution. I didn't have time. Very taxing to go through this process. But somebody said, you need to look at Centenary. I think it's just what you're looking for. And sure enough, those two circles of the Venn diagram when I looked at Centenary, for me, it overlapped very nicely. It's, like me, passionate about liberal arts. It's in the South. It's United Methodist, which is my faith tradition. It's excellent academically. And I said, this, there's something here. Threw my hat in the ring. You can blame Dr. Hendricks. He was on the search committee. Uh, so uh, it worked. I think it worked <coughs> out because, without getting 
mystical, you know, or spiritual. It worked because it was time. It was the right thing. That's my, that's my journey. You're on this, this trek journey, but you're on this broader journey to discover your vocation. But I really, for my sort of final point, I really want to stress how important it is and valuable it is that you're doing it here at Centenary. And that you're, and I, I mean, you could be doing it other places, but to be crass about it, what you, what we are selling and you are buying is what employers are buying too. I just got a couple of quick examples. You know, is that the, am I missing something? Three, oh, so, so that's, that's my life. I mean, I did these things. I discovered my passion, I planned, I implemented. Sometimes implementation didn't go very well. I monitored it. I was unhappy in what could have been my life's work. And I changed. So just a few things. We are, I believe, in the midst of a real change in the zeitgeist of employers. They understand what the value of what we are doing. I just got a couple of examples. So Forbes, uh, this is August 2015, uh, the golden tick, the new golden ticket. You don't have to get rich. How liberal, you don't have to code to get rich. How liberal arts grads are conquering Silicon Valley. <coughs> Liberal arts is the foundation for professional success in the 21st century, says the HuffPo. What are the skills that employers are looking for? You can read them. That's one of my pet peeves is reading things to you that's on the screen. Uh, but think about, think about those skills and think about how we are developing all of those here at Centenary in a very kind of cross-disciplinary way. Number three, I just want to point to you, communication skills, written, writing, written communication is still critical. If you will, excuse me, one personal anecdote, one of my older brothers, he's retired now, but he spent his career, well actually he had a career change too, uh, brought about in part by going into the army during the Vietnam era. He wanted to be a high school band teacher, realized as he watched his wife uh, teach music in that while he was in the army, that was not working out. While he was in the army, he went back to school, got his MBA, spent his career uh, working with uh, Price Waterhouse, uh, now PwC Price Waterhouse Coopers. For the last part of his career, he was in the Plano office, and he was in charge of the uh, partnership track, essentially. He's the gatekeeper to becoming a partner with Price Waterhouse, an extremely lucrative career. He told me a million times the number one reason that people don't make partner has nothing to do with their accounting skills. They recruit from the best MBA programs in the country. They didn't make partner because they couldn't write. They couldn't communicate what they knew in a form that other people could use it. Um, communication skills, leadership, not on this one, but I think it, well, interpersonal skills relates well to others. Um, you'll see it on a different slide, but another anecdote. I was in a meeting last, uh, when was it, the end of June, and one of the speakers was the president of Meharry Medical College uh, in Nashville. Uh, one of the great medical schools in the country and one of the leading providers, uh, leading trainers, especially of African-American doctors and dentists. But he hadn't been there too long, he'd just come from Johns Hopkins. And he said as part of the admissions process at the medical school at Johns Hopkins, as they sat around the table and considered each applicant for medical school, a topic I know is of interest to some of you, they asked explicitly, would you want this person treating your mother? And that takes into account medical skills, yes, but also takes into account communication and empathy and so forth. A couple of other examples. This is a, a nice, uh, the World Economic Forum, International, the future of jobs. Uh, not a lot of difference between 15 and 20, but again, note that, that there's very little that's in that is technical knowledge because the ground is changing so fast. You know this better than I do. The tools you're gonna to work with. I was talking to, the, I was, at, it was at Rotary actually on Tuesday, and there's a guy, he's the uh, CEO of, well it's not even a startup anymore, 
Um, it's a million dollar corporation here in Shreveport. It's got its office in the Regions Tower. It's a company called uh, um, Twin Engine, I think. Yeah. yeah. And um, he said, oh, I lost my train of thought trying to remember his name. Um, no, we were talking about, uh, he, they had just gotten approached by one of the old line companies in, in Shreveport. They're a um, drilling company and survey company. They needed a tool, they needed an app written day after tomorrow, practically, to go on their phone so that their guys out in the field, and they are mostly guys, and that's sexist there, um, so that they had GIS capacity to map these underground uh, rivers very quickly and very easily. I said to him, you know, I learned GIS, actually one of the things that I know Dr. Beeler here uh, teaches GIS. It's fascinating technology. When I started learning it, and it wasn't all that long ago, the only way that you could do GIS, the big, the main software called ArcGIS, ran on a dedicated terminal. You couldn't have it on your desktop, you, Lord knows you couldn't have it on a phone, and now of course you do run it on your phone. So the, the tools you're gonna be using are gonna change so fast Mark Cuban uh, was quoted last summer in Business Insider, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks, saying, liberal arts graduates are gonna be more valuable than computer scientists because you have all the data presented to you. Gathering the data is trivial. What you need is somebody who's <coughs> imaginative to look at the data and ask the right questions to see patterns but not fall into the too, too frequently fallen into trap of confusing correlation and causality. This is what we do. This is, a, this is an even weirder list. I didn't, I'm sorry, I got the source on a different slide, so I'm not, I'm not plagiarizing too badly. Um, <laughs> skills for the post-normal era. And again, you can just, just glance down them. They're a little weird, but, uh, but they're, they're noteworthy, I think. One of my colleagues who leads a college up in the Boston area says, you know, anything that can be automated will be automated. We need to be helping you develop uniquely human skills. I've told this joke this, uh, so many times, it's originally from Tom Friedman, you may have heard me say it. The factory of the future, a man, a machine, and a dog. The man is there to feed the dog, the dog is there to make sure the man doesn't touch the machine. <laughs> Anything that can be automated will be automated, including for some of those, you know, again, pre-med uh, surgeries, et cetera, et cetera. The kind of statistical work, if you're a political scientist, the kind of statistical work that when I was in graduate school was considered quantitative, sampling and, and polling and so forth, that's all now considered qualitative. That's just, you know, if you've got a whole data set, if you can analyze, as one scholar did, if you want to analyze an election, this is actually an election in China, you don't need to poll people, you've got a data set of something like 400 million tweets. <coughs> the world is changing. One last quote, I think. This is a relatively recent quote from a Google VP. What are they looking for when they uh, hire? For every job, the number one thing we look for is general, general cognitive ability. Not IQ, learning ability. The ability to process on the fly. And I don't know if, if you all have uh, if interviewed for jobs uh, recently, but if you're interviewing for a, an important job now, including some presidencies, they didn't do it for me, that you take these diagnostic things, you know, the next, the next version after Myers-Briggs, you know, uh, whether it's, it's a, a Big Five is one of them, there, there's a bunch of them. Knowledge down, we won't talk about it. Studies show there's a gap on the million jobs. We need more people with stem cells, but also arguing that the, to focus so narrowly on vocational application, we lose sight of the needs for passion, complex thinking, and creativity. We've come back full circle. What is your passion? How are you going to discover that? And how are you going to make that? How are you going to realize that in your life? Put two question marks here, partly to signal that I'm happy to answer questions. But for my last really substantive point, which is if you don't do anything else, <coughs> I would suggest that you use this time and as you go into your work life, 
get comfortable with ambiguity. Understand that you are not always going to have all the answers. Somebody is not always going to tell you what to do. You're not always going to know what to do. You're just going to have to start and do it. I will tell you, I know I sound so much like an old bogey, but in my experience as a, a provost and a president in small colleges where you've got a lot of people that are at the sort of director level, some of them will go on to be vice presidents and presidents, some of them won't. The number one distinguishing factor between those who will advance and those who won't, well, some of it's passion, some of them don't want to do it. But other than that, it's the comfort level with ambiguity. If you want to sit in your office and know exactly what your job description is and know exactly what's going to come through the door every morning, that's great and you'll be fine at a certain level, but you will never advance to the highest levels because being in charge means dealing with ambiguity, means dealing with extremely fluid situations and being able to change. I'm going to close and then I'll answer questions. I, want to, I just got this new book. <coughs> How many people know uh, the NPR initiative called um, uh, StoryCorps? So yeah, only, so this is a program that was started a number of years ago by a guy named Dave Isay. And it started as a sound booth in Grand Central Station. And they would have two people would come in and interview each other. And it was, a, it was an oral history project. And it's since grown. And um, now they have a couple, they have a couple of different um, static sound booths. And then they have an Airstream trailer that travels around the country. And it was just parked at, at a Broadmoor Library for a month. And people came and they told their stories. And, and they play them on the radio. Well, they select some and they play one on the radio every Friday morning. All of them are archived at the Library of Congress. So you've got this big um, uh, oral history project. And, and the ones they play are usually just incredibly touching in one way or another. Um, and uh, so anyway, um, I, I don't think it's any big secret. I just turned 60. Uh, my wife said, well, since the story course is here, why don't we go down and you can, we can sort of talk about you know, how you ended up where you are and so forth. So after doing that and looking at their website, they just, well, I don't know how new it is, it's this new book uh, of, of story core um, stories called Callings, the Purpose and Passion of Work. And since we're talking about that here, I ordered it, got it about a week ago, I started reading it. The stories are really good, but the actual, the parts I want to share with you here, just to close, are from the introduction by Dave Isaac. The idea for Callings came four years ago. It was around Mother's Day and our story core book about moms had just come out. They published a bunch of books on different themes. I was lucky enough to go on the Colbert Report to talk about it. My wife was pregnant with our second child at the time. The day after I did the show, we had an appointment with our beloved OBGYN, Austin Chin. I adored this woman from the minute I met her. Tiny, fierce, mercilessly blunt, brilliant at her work. I knew a little bit about her. I knew that she, was, she worked ferociously hard. I knew that she biked everywhere she went, to her office, to the hospital in the middle of the night to deliver babies. I knew that she had made the commitment to personally deliver the babies of every single one of her patients, which meant she was on call 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. She told me that she had tried to leave town only once in the 12 years since she'd started her practice to say goodbye to her father who was dying. But while she was there, a patient called to say she was in labor. Dr. Chen left so she could meet her patient at the hospital. She was not able to be with her dad when he died. Dr. Chen had seen me on TV the night before our appointment, and as we were leaving, she said, I wish I had done something important enough with my life to be in the full bear. I was stunned. I told her that as far as I was concerned, if you took everyone who had ever been on that show and added everything they'd accomplished, they wouldn't hold a candle to her. She shook her head and ushered me out of the office. When we're following our passion, sometimes we don't even recognize the kind of impacts we're having. Dave Isay had his own journey and change. He was in, uh, going to law school. Started out, I think, just started off doing some part-time work at the public radio station. Loved it and ended up in public radio. And he closes the introduction with this. Building StoryCorps has been the most difficult thing I've ever done, replete with moments of terror and doubt. But it's also been the most rewarding and nourishing work experience of my life. I can't imagine doing anything else. 
One of the original employees who helped launch StoryCorps described the work as hard work, blood work, love work, which is an apt description for the work lives of so many who are fortunate enough to find their callings. For those of you in search of your calling, consider yourself warned. This pursuit takes discipline, resilience, sacrifice, and tremendous hard work. At those moments when the fear creeps in and you're unsure of where to go or what to do next, remember to trust your instincts always. Allow yourself to be led by what truly moves you and don't compromise your values, ever. Whether you found your calling or on the journey or have lost your way, may the heroes of this book, whether astronaut, ballpark, beer vendor, or OBGYN, help remind you of the importance of finding meaning in your work. May their words help give you the strength to listen to that still, small voice inside, the voice which can help you discover the work that you were born to do. That's what we're doing. That's what we all do all the time. But this time, it, it, while you're at seminary, is such a unique opportunity to be able to do that exploration. That's why I love doing what I do. Thanks. Questions? Thanks for coming.